Chapter 18, Closure. I drove down to Redding, California to find a realtor to look at some property in the Shasta Mountain area. After a few days of house hunting, I returned back to the realtor's office for another search. I was taken aback when she asked me if I knew a lady named Mary Kane Simon from the Attorney General's office. Apparently, Kane Simon called the realtor asking questions about me. If I was a threat to her, the realtor, if I showed my badge and questioned what I was doing in the area. I immediately called Lanny to let him know I was being followed. How else would she know where I was? Stay in your hideout until I get this resolved. I headed back to the cabins in the mountains where I informed Mary Ann what had taken place. I received a call from Mary Ann, my girlfriend, who I had met while visiting my parents in Arizona, telling me that my father was in the hospital. My mother was battling cancer and was told she had a year to live. I was shocked to hear my father had fallen ill too. It was late July 2005. The weather was scorching hot when I arrived in Arizona a day later. After several tests, my father was diagnosed with stomach cancer, peritoneal adenocarymistosis. The doctor said he had less than a month to live. A week later, on August 2, 2005, I learned Sergeant James George's charges were sustained. My case was 04-0624E of Donald J. Vodica of whistleblowers retaliation in the position of correctional officer with Salinas Valley State Prison, Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation at Salinas. Judge Horst made the following order to the pursuant of the foregoing findings of fact and issues. In order to establish a claim for whistleblower retaliation, a complaint must demonstrate by preponderance of evidence that having made a protective disclosure was a contributing factor in retaliatory action against him or her. If a complainant meets this burden, the burden then shifts to the respondent to demonstrate by clear and convincing evidence that the action would have occurred for legitimate, independent reasons even if the complainant had not made a personal or protective disclosure. Government Code 8547.3 defines unlawful retaliation as follows. An employee may not directly or indirectly use or attempt to use the official authority or influence of the employee for the purpose of intimidating, threatening, coercing, commanding, or attempting to intimidate, threaten, coerce, or command any person for the purpose of interfering with the rights conferred pursuant to this article. In addition to an out threat, outright threat, intimidation, or coercion, the courts have found retaliation where the employee can show by preponderance of the evidence that he suffered an adverse employment action due to his protected activity. George was aware that complainant had filed a lawsuit against Archibald. The lawsuit related to complainant's protected disclosures about a green wall. George specifically referenced the lawsuit and then told the complainant to back off. George, however, is a supervisor and his conduct was inappropriate. It is concluded that, based on the totality of the circumstances, a letter of instruction advising George such action is an appropriate corrective measure. I was furious. According to the new matrix that was set in place for discipline measures by the federal courts of the Department of Corrections, a harsher penalty should have been given to Sergeant George. A letter of instruction is like a slap on the hand. The letter is removed from his personnel file after one year. Twelve days later, my father passed away on August 14, 2005. I stayed home that summer to take care of my ailing mother. I knew she was lonely without my dad. She passed away on Valentine's Day, February 14, 2006. I never got to say goodbye to her, but I knew that was okay. She would have responded with, we never say goodbye. We say, until we meet again. My case never went to trial. It was settled out of court by the California Department of Corrections. In the settlement, the California Department of Corrections wanted me to voluntarily resign from the department and after they would not contest my disability retirement and workers' compensation case. They also did not want me to return to any state service employment. Basically, they just wanted to pay me off and disappear. On April 13, 2006, I received a letter from Thelton E. Henderson, Senior United States District Judge for the United States District Court in San Francisco, California. 
Judge Henderson was overseeing the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation from a federal standpoint, along with Special Master John Hagler. Both men oversaw one of the most important cases against the California Department of Corrections, Madrid v. California Department of Corrections. The Madrid case was brought on by Pelican Bay State Prison. The letter contained the following. Thank you for your recent letter of support. The special master appointed for the Madrid litigation, John Hager, has been keeping me informed about your personal situation, including the retaliation you suffered after submitting reports concerning the Green Wall at Salinas Valley State Prison. At Mr. Hager's advice, I decided to wait to respond to your previous letter until your state court litigation had concluded. I understand that your case has now been resolved through a settlement agreement. I want to assure you I intend to continue vigorously monitoring the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation's handling of code of silence and investigative discipline issues. The court's remedial plans would not have been possible if it were not for correctional employees like yourself who have the courage to stand up against the code of silence. I want to emphasize to you personally that I have the utmost respect for the position that you took and sympathy concerning the many adverse consequences that resulted. Mr. Hager and I wish you the very best for the future. Signed by Judge Felton e. Henderson. I believe the California Department of Corrections has lost its integrity and ability to police itself. Complete structural reform from top to bottom is needed. The people and their elected or appointed leaders who give meaning to the value of the piece of paper on which any policy is written. If top officials neither understand nor care about the need for fair investigations, they are unlikely to investigate thoroughly or will investigate with prejudice. The code of silence is no stranger to the prison system, but there is a fine line between influence and intimidation. When the oath we took before starting, our career in law enforcement is compromised we are tested. Do we stand up in the pursuit of justice or do we cower and fall under intimidation? I am proud to know my feet never left the ground.